Hello. My name is Susan Hackley, and I'm the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar Series. This seminar is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and by the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. We are delighted to have Dr. Donna Hicks here today to discuss Leading with Dignity, how to create a culture that brings out the best in people. After she presents for about 35 minutes, we will open the discussion up to questions for the rest of the session. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have comments, please put those in the chat function. Thank you to Diane Long and Anna Chang for their help with this seminar. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Donna Hicks. She is an associate at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University, where she also served as deputy director of the program on international conflict analysis and resolution. She has worked extensively on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and in Sri Lanka, Northern Ireland, Colombia, and Libya and she has conducted several U.S.-Cuba dialogues. She is the Vice President of Ara Pacis, an Italian non-governmental conflict resolution organization that focuses on the human dimensions of conflict. Dr. Hicks was a consultant to the BBC, where she co-facilitated encounters between victims and perpetrators of the Northern Ireland conflict, working with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Dr. Hicks has taught courses in conflict resolution at Harvard, Clark, and Columbia universities, and she conducts trainings and educational seminars in the U.S. and abroad on the role that dignity plays in healing and reconciling relationships in conflict. She is the author of two books, Dignity, Its Essential Role in Resolving Conflict and Leading with Dignity, how to Create a Culture that Brings Out the Best in People. Both of these books were published by Yale University Press. Welcome, Dr. Donna Hicks. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, that was a very nice introduction, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I can't tell you that I'm usually the one introducing the, the speakers, um, and it's great to be sitting in the speaker's chair today. And it is the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar, after all. And I, I want to start by just thanking our beloved Professor Kelman. All of us who know him know that he is a perfect example of someone who has led his life with dignity. And he has uh, contributed so much to my own personal growth, and professional development. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, I will be forever grateful to you. Now, as Susan pointed out, I was, have been working all over the world for most of my career on these intractable international conflicts. And to make a very long story short, one of the things that I realized that when we were bringing parties together to try to create opportunities for dialogue was that there was something else happening in the room when we were sitting at those tables, it wasn't just about discussing the political issues that divided them, but I found out very early on that there really were two conversations taking place. One had no words, and that unspoken conversation I later discovered was all about dignity, about how angry and resentful the parties felt by the way the other side had been treating them. So I basically, I, I did a deep dive into this issue of dignity because I, I could see it everywhere. I could see it in Sri Lanka, in Northern Ireland, in Colombia, in the Middle East, everywhere where we were trying to, to give people opportunities to resolve their conflicts peacefully, um, this, this, this dignity issue showed up. And so it occurred to me that I think I better pay attention to this. I think I better research this. And after I did, I wrote this book, uh, the first book that Susan mentioned, um, Dig the role, Dignity, Its Essential Role in Resolving Conflict. 
And it was remarkable to me what I learned when I researched this. It took me seven years to write that first book. And what I learned was that dignity was not just about international conflicts. It was not, uh oh, Anna, I can't seem to advance the slide. Um, Anna or Diane? Hi, Donna. Um, I, how about I share your screen, your um, slides for you? Um, Definitely. Your, your yeah, because I can't advance. Right now. Oh, okay, go ahead. So, anyway, um, what I discovered was it wasn't just about international conflict that this issue would emerge. I realized that it showed up everywhere. It showed up everywhere where people were having um, conflicts. Whoops. And so we'll wait just one second for Anna to get this loaded. Okay. So no matter where I went in, in the world and tried to help parties, um, can you advance that one, um, Anna? Okay, here we go. So as I said, it showed up everywhere and it made me realize after doing all this research and, and that this was something fundamentally human. And I love this slide because John Nesbitt, I really sums up what I have learned over the years about dignity. That the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And I can tell you that at the core of our humanity is this deep desire to be treated with dignity, to be treated as if we mattered. And, but if you think about it, we spend so much of our time and in our intellectual development focusing on, you know, understandably focusing on mathematics and science, but what do we really know? How, how, much have we, how much time have we spent trying to understand the core issues of our humanity? And I can tell you that because we haven't done this, because we haven't spent that much time really trying to understand what, it's, what it means to be human, as, as Nesbitt points out, we've suffered tremendously. And we can see conflicts all over the world. And I'm going to suggest that so many of the conflicts that we experience, there is a dignity component to it, and we better understand it. We really better understand it. And you know, in my field, uh, in our field of international conflict, we always say, look, we've got to find common ground. We have to find common ground here in order to resolve these issues. But frankly, I think what we need to find is higher ground, not common ground. We need to elevate this conversation and we can elevate it with knowledge about what it means to be human and the role that dignity plays in that. Okay, Anna. And you know, the, there's a simple, there's a simple uh, truth that I've discovered in my research uh, on dignity. And the simple truth that goes like this, number one, we all wanna be treated with dignity. Number two, we all suffer when we're not treated with dignity. And the third part of that simple truth is when we are treated with dignity, we flourish as human beings. That is one of the core concepts of what it means to be human. And so if we're going to be in a leadership position, now I'm gonna shift the focus here a little bit to leadership because if we're going to lead people, we better understand them. And here's the thing about leadership. After I wrote that first book, I went into, I was asked to go into uh, organizations of all kinds, several of them corporate organizations, where they were having problems. And what I discovered was that people, especially in leadership positions, really hadn't even thought about dignity. They'd never considered dignity. And so I thought, well, this is very interesting. And the knowledge gap was just enormous, just enormous. And I thought, well, I, I think the first thing I, I have to do here is help people understand the impact that dignity has, the role that it plays in our lives and in our relationships. Okay, next one, Anna. And so why leadership? It's because I think that 
um, this is the missing link in our understanding about how to bring out the best in people, a deep understanding of dignity. And you know, we go to school, we get our MBAs, we get all of our graduate degrees if we're going to be in leadership positions or if we want leadership positions. And we spend so much time on that technical knowledge. But again, I think shedding light on this human knowledge and in particular, exactly what dignity is why it's important and how that affects the way people feel in their work environments. So as I said, if we're gonna lead people, we better understand them, but we cannot leave out this other half of the equation. Yes, technical knowledge, but human knowledge as well. Okay, Anna. And one of the reasons why this is so important for leadership is because in, a, in an organization, and if you're leading people, it's really important to develop a sense of trust. There's all kinds of literature that I reviewed for this, for, um, for my second book, Leading with Dignity. And if trust isn't there, then this is the beginning of where the work environment falls apart. It's a beginning of the uh, development of a toxic work environment. And the problem is with trust, it has to be earned. This is the thing about trust. What I've learned is it has to be earned. And the fastest way to earn trust with people in an organization is by treating them with dignity. And the other piece of this vulnerability, I'm gonna keep referring to this throughout the talk because vulnerability is where the truth resides. And if we can model that vulnerability and if we can tell the truth, in our organizations, if we're leading these organizations, instead of trying to cover it up, instead of trying to pretend it didn't happen, if we made a big mistake, this is crucial. Because you'll see in a minute that it is at the heart of um, why people feel safe in a work environment. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay, the next one. The other thing that we need uh, to do as leaders of um, organizations or companies or whatever, is that we have to model dignified behaviors. Now, the problem is we were all born with dignity and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. We were all born with dignity, but we're not born knowing how to act like it. And we really depend on our people in our leadership positions to help us, show us what it looks like, show what dignified behavior looks like. And so it's, um, it's really important that we model these behaviors. And the next slide will show, the next bullet point will show that we also need to model dignified relationships. And you know what the problem is, as I said earlier, there is really nowhere to learn this stuff. If you're going to be um, in a leadership position, what does dignity look like? What does it look like when I treat my people with dignity? What, what are relationships like? when both parties feel that their dignity is, is being honored and they feel safe and secure in those relationships. Okay, the next one. And this is probably one of the most important aspects of why leaders need to know and understand how to lead with dignity. It helps our people become more emotionally skilled. Now, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but one of the things that happens in an organization is that people are depend they, they, they expect, they're people who work with you and for you, depend, expect that you are going to be treating them well. And if they, and if you don't, if you don't, as I said, create a safe environment for them, then they're all, their emotional stability at the workplace or in wherever the organization, wherever people are leading. In that organization, there is no, there's like a, this sand that's shifting all the time. We need to create an emotional infrastructure within the organization so that people do feel safe. They do feel like they can speak up if something bad happens to them. And showing them that, like if you're in a leadership position and you make a mistake and you say to your people, look, oh, gosh, I can't believe it. I just made a terrible policy decision and I'm afraid it's going to affect all of you and I'm sorry. Well, 
that is demonstrating a skilled emotional reaction to having made a mistake rather than trying to cover it up. I'm gonna say more about that in a minute. Okay, so the next slide. So what is dignity? Uh, before we go any further, I wanna be sure that we're all on the same page. I've decided that after researching all of the literature in, um, on dignity, that, and most of it was in philosophy and theology, there was no practical, practical definition of what dignity is. So I came up with a really simple definition in the first um, bullet. And that very simple definition that is that our dignity is our inherent value and vulnerability as human beings. Now, inherent value, yes, we were all born worthy. We, were all, we came into the world with value. And um, if you want to advance the next slide, the next second, um, yeah, it's different from respect. I'm going to say a little bit about that in a minute, but go to the next one. So we all enter the world and if you, with, with dignity. If you see these little ones, you think, oh my gosh, how precious, how wonderful, how valuable. I mean, would you even question whether these little ones have value? Well, of course they have value. And in fact, I think we would all agree that they're invaluable, that they're priceless and irreplaceable. They are little raw bundles of dignity ready to develop into themselves. And so what do we do? What do we do with something that's invaluable, priceless and irreplaceable? Well, yes, of course, we protect it. We nurture it. We, be, we are sure we want to make sure that they're they're evolving and growing. Now, the thing about vulnerability, which was the second half of my definition, is that we, can, we know that these little ones, that they're, they're physically vulnerable. But the fact is their dignity, this precious, fragile dignity is equally as vulnerable. And we have to create um, the same kind of focused care and attention to their dignity that we would on any other aspect of their, of their human growth. So, you know, I honestly feel like one of the things that I'm, I aspire to do, and I'm going to invite you to think about this too, is that when you, you know, when you come in contact with other people, other human beings, try to think of them as these little, young, precious babies. Try to think of how adorable they were at that young age, and try to think about how you would have treated them if they were little infants. You know, I, have, I just heard a podcast uh, by uh, where uh, Senator John Lewis was being, uh, Senator, where Congressman Lewis was being um, interviewed. And he said, um, somewhat the interviewer asked him about the times that he was in Selma protesting, crossing the bridge and how he was beaten up so severely on the other side. And you know, John, John Lewis was a big proponent of love. You know, he was, he was true to that whole idea that we have to create more love in the world. And so when the interviewer said, said to him, well, how did, how did you feel about the guy who almost killed you? He pummeled you nearly to death. How did you feel? Did you, did you feel love for him? And he said this, he said, I looked at that man and I asked myself, and try to remember, he said, I tried to remember what he must have been like when he was a little baby. And remember, remember that preciousness, he said. He said, but then I also asked myself, what happened to him? What happened to him that he could treat me so badly? And so I want to share that story because, you know, when all of us get into conflicts with people and we see a whole lot of conflict in the world right now. And I think if we can get back to that space where this was a precious child who is now grown up, but for some reason is really wreaking a lot of havoc on relationships and on people, you have to ask yourself, what happened? What happened to this person? Okay, so I wanna go back to this other idea that dignity is different from respect because I do think it's different from respect. I think dignity is something, as, I, as you see, that we're born with. And in fact, I think dignity is our highest common denominator. Every single one of us have it and we, we yearn to be treated that way. Now, respect on the other hand, 
I feel it has to be earned. And, you know, and when I was working in international conflicts, the parties would always say, we demand respect. We demand respect. And I would say to them, wait a minute, after I'd researched this dignity stuff, I said, wait a minute, you can't demand respect. I think what you're demanding, what you want to demand is to be treated like a human being, to be treated with dignity. If we could get to that point in the world where we were actually treating each other with dignity, I mean, imagine what a different world we'd all be living in. So I think respect has to be earned. And I think dignity is our baseline. It's our starting point. We all deserve to be treated with dignity. So again, I want to remind you that even though we were all born with dignity, we're not necessarily born knowing how to act like it. So um, the next slide, Anna. I want to share with you some, um, some research that I found, uh, the social, uh, social neuroscience research, because I was looking I was desperate to find hard data that showed that this dignity issue was important, that we, we as practitioners, that we, we as leaders, all of us had to really pay attention to it. And because I could tell my stories about how I could see that the dignity was violated by all these conflicts and everything, and how it played a fundamental role in keeping these conflicts of, alive. I could say all that, but there, that's just anecdotal evidence. What I was looking for was something concrete, and I found it with Matt Lieberman and Naomi Eisenberg's research, social neuroscience research, out in, they're out in UCLA. And what they showed was that, well, first of all, they, they put people in fMRIs into these brain scans, and they uh, exposed them to, to scenarios of different, different types of situations. So when they exposed their subjects to uh, a scenario where the person was be injured physically, broke his arm. Well, you can advance the slide. The, the, the thing that happened was it showed that the part of the brain that was illuminated, no, not yet, just hold on a second. <laughs> the part of the brain that was illuminated was the ancient pain center deep in the limbic system and an area of the brain called the amygdala. And of course, if you have a physical injury, you're going to feel that in your brain is going to experience that as pain. And it's the, it's the place where all of the emotions, you know, strong emotions are also emanate from in the brain. Okay, the next uh, slide is that the interesting thing, now that was, of course, you would expect when you're um, physically hurt, injured, that you're going to feel that pain. But what was shocking to me about their research was that they found that when dignity was violated, I'm going to dance it again, um, it showed up in the brain in the same area as if you were experiencing a physical injury. Yeah, the brain doesn't know the difference between a wound to our dignity and, and, and physical pain. Now, I was, just, I was just floored by this research. It was a sea change for me because I could take it into organizations that were suffering from really bad conflicts. And I could say to them, look, here's the problem. The problem is that there are all these unaddressed dignity violations that are taking place here that we're, and where nobody's talking about them. We have to give them air. We have to, we have to let people talk about what's, what's going on with them. And, and you see, the problem with these, these dignity violations, as this research demonstrates, is that when you have a physical injury, the first thing we do, we go to the doctor, we get it taken care of, that guy's got a nice cast put on, but yet when we have our dignity violated, when somebody humiliates us, when somebody degrades us, treats us badly, there's no, there's no place to go. There's no 911 call. There's no emergency room you can run to to get that injury healed. And in fact, what happens inside that uh, the researchers showed that these, these emotional impacts of these dignity violations stockpile in there. And then all of a sudden, one day, you know, you see the person explode. So I, I'm, I'm really clear that this research really helped take me to a place in my, my practice with people where I could say, 
dignity matters. If you're in a leadership position, you have to learn about it. You have to know what it feels like. You have to know how people respond. You have to know about the effect that you have on people if you maybe even unknowingly uh, violate their dignity. So this is really exciting. And, and you know what? People were not surprised by this. At the same time, they thought, okay, let's get to work. We've got to do something. All right, the next slide. So another bit, part of my research and, um, was that I realized that if I was going to make this issue of dignity um, practical in my, uh, when I went in to co for consultations or worked with parties in conflict, that I had to make it very concrete. I had to make it concrete. I had to show them exactly what it looked like to have, have their dignity either violated or honored. And long story short about my research, but I've, I've, I've interviewed people from all over the world and asked them about how they would want to be treated if, they're, if they were treated with dignity. And they, these 10 themes emerged. These themes emerged no matter where I was in the world. I was expecting I was going to find big cultural differences in, in how people wanted to be treated. But the fact was these 10 elements came through. And what are they? All right, so first, people want their identity accepted, no matter who they are, no matter their race, their religion, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their physical capabilities. People wanted to be treated as equal in dignity. Now, as leaders, we may differ in status, but we are all equal in dignity. Recognition. People want recognition for a job well done. They want to, you know, to have their leaders say, gee, you know, this was really a great contribution you just made to, to the organization. Thank you for that. People want acknowledgement. You know, when I was working with Desmond Tutu, I asked him once, I said, you know, what do people need to put the past to rest? And he said to me, well, Donna, here's what they need. He said, when people have been roughed up, they need acknowledgement for the suffering that they've endured. And I thought, bingo, this is it. So we better get really comfortable with acknowledgement. We have to figure out, we as leaders, how do we do that? What does it look like? Um, and of course, inclusion, you know, all of you probably have done lots of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Everybody wants to feel like they belong. Everybody wants to feel that sense that, yeah, I belong here. Um, and safety. Now, this isn't just physical safety, but it, it's important physical safety. But in this context, also in the context of dignity, people want to feel safe to speak up if something bad happens to them. They want to feel, be able to be their authentic self uh, in their workplace. So that's really critically important. Fairness. These are all common sense. You know, people say to me, oh, Donna, these are, you know, this, these are really just common sense. I said, yeah, they are common sense, but they're not common knowledge. We have to focus our attention on these and we have to learn these. We have to learn about what they, what, what does fairness look like when somebody's had their dignity violated? What, do, what does, what does that experience like for people? Independence, understanding, people want to be given the benefit of the doubt and people want accountability. So what does this mean? They, what they say is that if something, somebody violates their dignity, they want an apology. And it's not just an apology, it's I'm sorry and I'm gonna work really hard at not doing that again. So that second piece is critically important. So now when these 10 elements of dignity are in place um, in a, uh, in an organization when the leadership and the um, people who are their direct reports, when they are in relationship with one another, where these elements of dignity are being honored, it's a very strong, powerful force. And people feel a tremendous sense of well being. Now, it's a stabilizing force. Remember, I said earlier that we have to create an emotional infrastructure. We have to show people that it's okay to be vulnerable, it's safe, that, you know. Having, having these elements of dignity at play as the medium of exchange in your interactions with people, this will make a good relationship strong and you'll see the effects of it right away. 
And I just want to tell you a little short story about when I was first doing the um, interviews uh, around um, asking people about, you know, how they want to be treated. When I went into um, uh, the corporate environment, I asked people, okay, here's the 10 elements of dignity. Which one do you feel is most often violated at your, in your workplace? And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, they're going to say fairness, or they're going to say recognition or identity, something like that. But 80% of the people reported that safety was the most violated element in their work environment, 80%. And this was like 2,000 people I interviewed. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Nobody feels safe. What's that about? And the people said, if, if my boss or my manager violates my dignity, I'm terrified to speak up. I, I'm not going to, you know, risk a good performance review or so all of these dignity violations are, you know, swarming around these work environments, creating cultures where people feel fearful, they don't want to speak up, they can't be their authentic selves. So I just think that that story is notable and maybe we can discuss it more um, if there's more time. But these these elements create that scaffolding, that emotional scaffolding that people need in order to, 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 to flourish in their workplace. All right, the next one. I just want to show you that a lot of my colleagues um, in the business community have done research on um, what happens when you treat your people with dignity in the work environment. And here's what they, what they showed. Sees all of these things, dependability, employee engagement, productivity, all of these things increase, increase when people feel like they're being treated well, when their dignity is being honored. Dependability, employee engagement, productivity, they're willing to give discretionary energy, retention, job retention, people stay in those jobs. Now I've got trust here in CAPS because it's, I, I mentioned this earlier, that if you want your people to trust you, just start treating them with dignity. It's, it's, it's a fast track to trust. And of course, in the corporate environment, what they tell me, my colleagues, is that profits, profits also increase. Now, you know, I think, that's, I think that's great. I think it's even greater that you decide to treat people with dignity because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but how wonderful that profits increase as well. So uh, you can take, go to the next slide. So here's one thing I wanted to um, share with you that uh, I'm the, I don't have a lot of time to discuss this, but one of the things that I explored when I was doing my uh, research was the uh, field of evolutionary biology. Because keep in mind, I was interested in what it means to be human. And the evolutionary biologists know so much about what it means to be human that I never was exposed to. And all my, you know, I've got five degrees and I never learned anything about evolutionary biology in my conflict resolution training. And so one of the things that we discovered, that they discovered is that people hate situations where they feel they're looking bad in the eyes of others. They hate it. And so we will do anything, we humans will do anything to avoid that humiliating experience. There's a profound fear of humiliation that we have. And so if we mess up, if we make a mistake, what's the first thing we do from this evolutionary biological uh, point of view? Well, what do we do? We try to cover it up. We try, we lie, we deceive others, we try everything so that we can avoid that dreaded feeling of uh, being exposed for our wrongdoing. Now, this, there's so much more to say about this, and you can take a look at my Leading with Dignity book as I go into great detail on this. But here's the thing. When you're in a leadership position, and if you don't know this, that you're going to have, your biology is going to trigger you to want to cover up something that might be a mistake. If you don't know that, then you're gonna get in huge trouble with your, with your people. They're gonna sense that you're lying. And the, again, as I told you earlier, the greatest casualty here is the truth. Because if you don't make yourself vulnerable and tell the truth, then that's when all hell breaks loose. So, okay, the next slide. 
So here's, here's the thing, um, just a sum. I'm just going to sum this up here by saying dignity leaders, this among many other things, but the things that I think are critically important, they use power to empower others, not to control others. We use, we understand those of people who are leading with dignity, understand the value of relationships. Without good connections with other human beings, you're not going to be function well as a leader. You have to understand the value of human connection. We set the tone um, as, as, as leaders. Setting the tone, you know, here's the thing. People watch our, our people are watching every move a leader makes. Every move a leader makes. They will pay less attention to what you say and more attention to what you do. So this is why modif mo uh, modeling these dignified behaviors, dignified relationships is so important. Handle mistakes by creating learning opportunities. Learning opportunities, not an instinct to cover it up and pretend it didn't happen. Because all of this, when people feel they're treated well, here's another piece of research from the business community. People feel when they are treated well in their organizations and they're working towards something that really matters to them, it gives them a sense of purpose and meaning. They really feel like they're doing something worthwhile. And you know, finally, understanding that it takes strength to be vulnerable. Covering up and lying isn't a, doesn't, isn't, uh, a demonstration of strength. So showing that, making yourself vulnerable, it, it takes strength to be vulnerable. So just shifting that default understanding. Vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability is strength. And so to have that um, as in par a part, all of these things in your leadership repertoire, repertoire um, you're going you're gonna to see some amazing uh, changes or you, maybe many of you already do this. I'm not going to assume that you don't. I'm assuming that a lot of people already know this. Okay, this the last slide. So the final thing, I love this quote by uh, Victor Hugo. Nothing is more important and more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And dignity's time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, so much for this wonderful talk. And I recommend her book so highly. All right, so we have time for some questions. There are a lot of questions. I'm going to, uh, we'll get to as many as we can. And if you don't get your question answered, I recommend getting Donna's book. And some of the questions, Donna, you did answer in your talk. Um, it's fun. People have been putting in chat where they come from. We have people from Pakistan, Italy, Mexico, Dubai, Cyprus, Brazil, Costa Rica, The Hague, Indonesia, Croatia, Ireland, India. Um, so it's an amazing group. Um, so here's, here's the first question, um, which takes note that we are in a time of pandemic, really around the world. And leadership, this questioner asks, in times of the pandemic, is a particular challenge. What should we do in dealing with conflict in an online setting? How do you build positive relations through online communications like video conferencing? Donna, your thoughts? Yes, I get this question all the time, Susan. And um, first of all, I am just delighted that we have so many people from all over the world. I just, it just thrills me to know that, um, that you're all here. So thank you so much. And, you know, I've often said, in fact, I do a, uh, a webinar on um, dignity in the time of crisis. And the fact is, this leadership, what I've just shared with you, all of these skills and all of this knowledge about good leadership, it's critically important even before the pandemic, of course. I mean, it was really important. But now it's extremely important because good leadership is, let me just put it this way, I think we're in a leadership crisis right now. And so it's not just the pandemic, but we're also in a crisis around leadership. And if we can, and all of us, I would invite all of us to take up this challenge. And you know, th this, this opportunity that I have here is more than just an academic exercise for me. This is like, this is so my life's work right now. And I I'm asking you all 
to take up this challenge. It's a call to action. And so what does that mean? What does it look like? Like the, the person asks, what do you do if you're a leader and you have, you have people online that are obviously in conflict? Well, it's, it's, you have to be hyper vigilant now. And I mean hyper vigilant about being able to recognize what the dignity issues are that are underlying um, the problems in the relationship. Because even though they're online, it doesn't mean that they're any different from what happens when we're all together. And so what I would do, I would, um, I would really talk to the people, and that's the other thing. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Just, just be sure that you address it and say, look, I'm sensing some tension here. Is there something, some way that we can have a discussion about why you're obviously terribly upset? Is there some way that we can just push the pause button here on this meeting and have a discussion about what is really bothering you? And if you don't want to do that in the large group setting, I would strongly urge you to take both people individually aside and say, tell me what's happening with you. Tell me what's happening. And using this dignity framing, now you have the 10 elements of dignity there. You can hear, listen for what's going on. Listen for the fact that people didn't feel like they were treated fairly or they were being excluded or you know, they felt like they didn't get the recognition they deserve. Anyway, you've got language now. That's the exciting thing. And that I think is what my biggest contribution is giving people language to address these things. So as a leader, don't be afraid to address it using this language. Great. So building on that, here's the next question. In a time of collective trauma, personal trauma and vicarious trauma, does this understanding of crisis and trauma help define your definition of dignity? Does it change your methods in facilitating conversations or advising leaders? <laughs> you know, it's so interesting that this person brings up that word trauma because when I was first um, investigating dignity, I would experiment with some of the parties in the conflicts that I were, was working on. And I would say, because I knew that this emotional piece had to, be, had to be addressed before we could get into the deep problem solving that was uh, required for a peace agreement. So I thought, I, I, so I studied trauma. I studied all of that literature and I found, um, I thought, well, this is really important. I'm going to ask the parties if they'd be willing to talk about a time when they felt they're, um, they're, you know, they'd been traumatized by this conflict. And, oh, Susan, it was always, it was so consistent. They would come back to me and say, trauma? We're not traumatized. We've got serious injustice issues. And once we get these things worked out, we're going to be fine. So I thought, oh boy, can't use that word, right? But then after searching and searching and having this epiphany about dignity, I would say to them, look, you know, you've all had, um, this has been really difficult for you and your communities. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure that there have been numerous times when you felt your dignity has been violated by this conflict. Would you be willing to have a discussion about that? And lo and behold, Susan, it was like the doors open, magic entered the room. Because when I said to them, yeah, your dignity was violated, that's why you're upset. There was something validating to them that it wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't something that was like a weak trauma that you're, you know, you're suffering. It was a real violation of your dignity and that's why. So it seemed to give them a sense of, okay, yeah, let's talk about this. We really do need to talk about this. And again, the door is open. So it, it, it the word trauma, it's sort of in a back uh, channel way, definitely did uh, contribute to my understanding and, and definition of dignity, yes. Right, and I think um, there's a lot more trauma being experienced by so many of us that it's safe to call it that, really. Yes. Um, so here's a question from Pakistan. I lead the National COVID Secretariat at the Planning Commission in Pakistan. The uncertain situation and pressures to respond quickly has created a very stressful work environment. Each team member has his or her 
individual and personal crisis to deal with, and everyone has to adapt to this new normal. How can you keep your team motivated to give it their best? Well, the important thing, of course, is to stay connected, you know, is to stay connected with them. And, and again, if you're seeing signs of distress and you're seeing that people are so obviously and understandably having a hard time, it's something you don't want to ignore. You really want to address it. You really want to tell them that you are, um, you are there for them, that you want to hear what's, you know, what's happening in there because work life is one thing. What about the other aspects that probably are experiencing all kinds of issues at home? Um, this is a challenge for every family, no matter where. And so, but I, I, the, the, the key is to stay connected, keep that human connection open and ask them, talk to them about it. Um, and even using the language, the using the dignity language, you know, say, you can even say, it sounds like you're having your dignity challenged by in a, in a you know, million ways here. So let's, let's just try to address them one by one and let's see if we can't figure something out. But, you know, creating that safe space for people to talk to you about what's really going on with them is essential. Yes, thank you. Um, so does an office, sorry, this thing just moved. Uh, once an office environment has become toxic, where staff have not been treated with respect, can it be turned around under the same leadership? And say that, I'm just gonna add this, the leadership isn't willing to apologize or acknowledge what they've done wrong. What can the staff do? Well, I think that's a really hard situation. Um, you know, one of the things that I always say is to people is if you really do believe that if you go to your, your manager, let's say, and you talk to her or you talk to him about what is happening, and not in a threatening way, but just in a way that you want to impart some information that you have about what's happening internally among your people, if you can go to the leader and he or she responds by saying, oh, wow, tell me more. You know, I had no idea that this was happening. Well, obviously that's the best case scenario. But if you get resistance, if you get resistance immediately and push back from the leader, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it's, it, it's even safe for you to bring this up. So um, it's a really tough one. But, and, and I think one of the things that I spend a lot of time on in when I do workshops around giving people feedback is how to do it. So that elite, especially to someone in a leadership position who feels like they're so, he or she has so much more status than you, but how do you approach that person? Um, and again, you wanna try to deliver the feedback in a way that still maintains that person's dignity. You know, you want, you don't want to make it sound like ultra criticism or you just want to help them see what everybody else can see, but he or she can't. Oh, very difficult. So, um, what is your response to the person who's so emotionally intelligent that they're a master manipulator who chooses to use their gift as a negative force within the organization. They're highly skilled at this. Yeah, well, I, that's not a dignity leader, that's for sure. I would say that's definitely uh, a master manipulator. And so, you know, I, I, I don't see that as leading with dignity at all. Yeah, it isn't. And, um, so respect for the dignity of others is linked to emotional intelligence which is linked to self-esteem. Therefore, the root of recognizing di dignity in a leadership situation will heavily rely on each individual's ability to consciously manage his or her defense mechanisms during a perceived aggression to his or her dignity. At the root of it, better leadership negotiations require psychological growth that may not come naturally. Uh, what devices are most successful in your experience to address this potential deficiency in third parties? Well, um, 
you know, first of all, let me address the, the, the part that uh, the, the person um, connected in the beginning that dignity is related to self-esteem. Um, and I think actually it's different. I think, yes, your sense of inherent value and worth, your, your dignity is something that is, um, we're born with. It's something inborn, but you know, not everybody knows that that's the case. But the, the but dignity, I think, that knowledge of our own internal self worth is way bigger than self esteem, because I think self esteem can come and go. You know, you can feel bad about yourself for messing up, and but the idea of dignity, dignity is something that no matter. If we learn how to do this, and this is addressing the second part of the question, if we can learn how to stop ourselves from berating ourselves from making a mistake, or you know, you talked about those defense mechanisms when somebody else violates you, if we can understand that those defense mechanisms are really protecting us from this momentary, you know. Uh, problem and not our inherent value and worth. We have to make a distinction between those things. Our worth is always there. You know, Desmond Tutu said to me once, he said, because I said um, to him that, you know, people feel like their dignity is stripped away from them by these conflicts. He got so mad at me. He got so upset with me and he's, I was horrified. But he, he said, don't, don't perpetuate this myth with people when they say that their dignity has been stripped. He says, nobody can take our dignity away from us. Nobody. And he said, how do you think we got through apartheid? The only thing we had was to hang on to in those, in those moments was our dignity. So I think, you know, if to be a really skilled um, person, even if you're mistreated, even if you end up feeling bad, uh, about that situation, knowing that you are not bad, but that something bad happened to you and that your dignity is still there. It's still intact, but it has a wound and we have to heal from it. We have to pay attention to that. So, you know, I think the, de the, the defense mechanisms really do protect us from thinking that we're unworthy but this is my message to you and via Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you're always worthy. Nothing that can happen to you will ever take away from your worth. It may affect your self-esteem, but it won't affect your dignity. It'll, it'll always be there with you. Beautiful message. Um, someone commented that these 10 elements of dignity seem similar to what Marshall Rosenberg says are basic needs that we all have. Are, you, are, are these the same thing? Is there a difference? Well, you know, I, I was trained in the human needs theory, um, uh, John Burton's human needs theory as a conflict resolution uh, student. And, and I always had a problem with thinking about dignity as a need. I think about dignity as part of what it means to be human. That's why I opened up with that, this conversation with that slide. It is the core of what it means to be human. We all have dignity. And it's not like we need dignity because we have it already. But what, what I think is similar, and I love his work, but what I think is similar is um, you know, how those needs get fulfilled, how, they, how we get treated in such, a, how, we, how we treat ourselves and others so that that dignity becomes a way of life and part of who we are as human beings. But, you know, we need food and we need shelter, but we already have dignity from the moment we enter the world. So that's how I, I see the, the difference. So maybe just time for um, two more. Uh, why do you think that we as a society and why have our companies lost the knowledge and understanding of dignity? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. That's really wonderful. You know, I, I have um, my colleagues with whom I work uh, in the business, uh, business academia, they, they believe that this is um, a 
a problem of ignorance that nowhere in the business world, in the MBA programs, do people get taught about how to treat others with dignity, what it looks like, how people react, you know, all this basic stuff that I introduced today. Um, they feel like it's just not part of the coursework and learning how to be a good business leader. And in fact, my colleagues, Michael Pearson, and there's so many of my colleagues, Manuel Guillon, uh, they all um, are a part of this network called the Humanistic Management Network. And you might want to be uh, what, connect with them. You just go online and Google Humanistic Management Network. And what they're trying to do is create a new business paradigm where human dignity, protection and preservation of human dignity is at the core of the new business paradigm. Not shareholder profits or maximization of wealth, but the focus is on human dignity and promoting that in the workplace. And as I told you, one of those slides that I showed was all the things that happen when leaders do treat their people with dignity. Increases loyalty, dependability, productivity, retention, job retention, trust and profits, all these things happen when you focus on dignity. But if you're not exposed to that, if you're in the old school, old world business schools, it's not gonna happen. But fortunately, I'm telling you, my colleagues are really hard at work at this, my business um, colleagues. So Humanistic Management Network, if you wanna see more. All right, last question. Does treating people with dignity work when you're dealing with someone who's not re reciprocating, someone who's treating you in an undignified manner? Well, one of the things that I, uh, I have in my book is, um, there, it's called The 10 Temptations to Violate Our Own Dignity. <laughs> and at the top of the list of these 10 temptations um, is don't take the bait. Don't let the bad behavior of others determine how you're going to act. So, you know, it's, it's, but it, it is such a temptation to want to return the harm, get even. I mean, in conflict, big conflict situations, you see revenge, retaliation. So, but you know, you only end up violating your own dignity if you return the harm and you become a perpetrator, you know, you become a dignity violator, but, and this is part of, holding these, these um, temptations, these, these things that evolutionary biologists know are, can get triggered in a nanosecond. If you don't control them, they're gonna control you. And as Jerome Barco says, biology is not destiny unless you ignore it. So we have to know, don't take the bait, don't let that happen because you'll only end up violating yourself and others. Donna Hicks, thank you so much for this really illuminating and uh, warm talk, which gives us so many ideas to put into use in our own lives and so many great examples of how valuable this work can be. Um, to everyone who participated and listened in, thank you for coming. We send love to you all over the world. Uh, please come to some other Kelman Seminar Series events. Uh, you can read about them on the Program on Negotiation website and register for them. So thank you so much to all of you. Goodbye.